your compensation as an architect and the level of the work that you're able to produce and create is ultimately determined by the perception of the value of your architectural services. Business of Architecture UK, episode 160. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. My name is Enoch Sears. In today's episode, I will be hosting it. We're going to be having a discussion around communicating your value as an architect. And the question I have for you today, we're going to jump right into the content today. It's actually going to be, we're going to be sharing some content as opposed to doing an interview today. But the question that I'd like to pose for you today is, what is value? What is value as it comes to architectural services? And Are you being compensated both in recognition and money for the enormous value that you bring to the table as an architect? Do you find that clients clearly recognize your value? Can they articulate the value that you have? Can you articulate it? What I've found in my career as an architect is that oftentimes value is invisible. It's difficult to describe, it's difficult to communicate, and it's especially frustrating when clients don't understand or get the value of architectural services especially when they're unwilling to pay for it. Now, this has adverse consequences because ultimately what happens is it creates fee constriction. It creates fee pressure on architectural firms that want to do excellent work, but find that at the end of the day, they're putting in so much work, it's dipping into the fee. They're having difficulty producing the high quality work that they know they can produce because clients are resistant or unwilling to pay for what's really required to do the high quality work that you want to do as an architect. What we find is that often there's a misalignment between the perception of us as architects and our clients in terms of value. As a result, it's not uncommon for design firms to have their fees questioned and examined by clients, be price shopped, and compete with other firms on fee alone. And when you've spent years and years and years going through the certifications necessary, the registrations, the tests, the internships, the different levels, uh, the education to be registered, licensed as an architect. It's frustrating when clients are unwilling to pay our fees or unwilling to see the value that you provide as an architect. As mentioned, this creates a working pressure that decreases the quality of work overall and it also decreases creative innovation because when we're scrambling to get work done, when we feel like we're managing an up and down cash flow, how can we have the space to innovate, to create better spaces, to focus on design, not to mention the stress and business problems that it causes for us practitioners. Now, ultimately, any commercial transaction is a transaction of value. You give me money, I give you a product, an experience, a service in exchange. Each party exchanges something of value for something they value more. And often, we think of value exchange in terms of money, but Really, money is just a representation of value. It's not value itself. Now, there's a study called semiotics. There's a concept that we're going to be talking about today, and this is actually going to be a two-part episode broken up into two, two different segments. But semiotics tells us that language is composed of signs, signifier, which is defined as a sound image, more on that later, and the signified, which is a mental concept. Now, this is something that I learned about back in architecture school when I was at Cornell University. Our professor, Val Wark, he was our teacher who taught us the theory of architectural, theory of architecture, I believe, was the name of the course. And at the time, it was completely over my head, and I had no idea what he was talking about. But he did go into this idea of signs, signifier, and signified. And it's starting to make more sense. Now, On an architectural sense, if you've had this education, you understand what this means in terms of architecture. It means that architecture has meaning. So there's meaning that goes into the buildings we design above and beyond a roof, shelter, warmth, protection from the elements. And this is something that it's been a challenge for me to describe even to my wife. What is the meaning of architecture? Why do architects do one thing instead of another thing? Beyond a building, What's the actual inherent meaning? Why does architecture matter to humanity? What's the significance of a building? These are the things that as architects we can see. One of the things that I love as an architect is I love to see a beautifully detailed building. I love to see the ways and I can can gain insight into the thought that went into putting a design element in a certain place as opposed to another place. It's beautiful to see. For me, 
this is one of the beauties of architecture. But to the untrained eye, these things go unnoticed. When we examine value through the lens of semiotics, what we realize is that value and money are mere mental constructs. In other words, money itself has no inherent value. Let's face it, if the world collapsed tomorrow, heaven forbid, all my dollar bills or all my great British pounds, they would be nothing more than kindling for my fire to keep me warm. So what we discover is that money has no inherent value. It only has the perception of value. And this is why we see things such as inflation, deflation, negotiation, all of that depends on the perception of value. Now, when we look at value from this perspective, it informs us how to position, how to describe, and how to value architectural services. When we understand this as pr practitioners, what we realize and what starts to open up for us is that value is not a fixed construct, meaning that value, the value of architectural services, it's not objective. We can't line it up on a spreadsheet and figure out, okay, exactly what is the value of architecture, which leaves some very interesting conversations that can happen. The value and the perception of value can be molded, it can be influenced, and it can be shaped. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. This is just a preamble. So with that, let's jump into today's episode on how to communicate your value and the value of architectural services as an architect. Why is the concept of value important? Why are we even having this conversation? Why is the concept of value important to an architectural practice? Well, there are a number of reasons why understanding value as a concept is important in what we might call the exchange or the providing of architectural services. Number one is that the ability to win a commission, the ability to win a project, the ability to win a contract, the ability to have a client hire you and your firm to provide architectural services, to design a building, to do a master plan, to do a wayfinding study, to do a schematic design, whatever it is that you're hired to do. All of this hinges on a proposed solution being perceived as more valuable than other proposed solutions. So this is number one. Number two, the fee that can be charged is in direct correlation to the perceived value of a solution. In other words, if your solution is perceived as highly valuable, you will be able to charge a commensurately high fee. And if your service is not perceived as valuable, then it will be a struggle to be able to charge the fee that you need to do the project. And not only the fee to do the project, but the fee to be able to grow your company, the fee to be able to give wonderful bonuses and high compensation to your team members, the key to be able to create a culture that attracts the kind of team members that you want to work with, the key to creating a business asset that can operate without you always at the helm and in the weeds, or even being able to survive and to thrive through the inevitable up and downs that happen in the economy. Number three, value is important because it is linked directly to the respect and deference that clients give you in deference to your expertise. Because ultimately, the respect and deference that they give you as an architect is directly related to the perceived value of your services. Now, Webster's Dictionary def gives three definitions for value that are useful for our conversation here today. Number one, simply the monetary worth of something. Number two, a fair return or equivalent in goods, services, or money for something exchanged and number three, something such as a principle or quality intrinsically valuable or desirable. So we have three definitions here. Number one is simply the monetary worth of something. Number two is a fair return or equivalent in good services or money for something exchanged. Or number three, something that's intrinsically valuable or desirable. So what we see from these given definitions is that value relates to the monetary worth of something, the perception of a fair exchange, or the desirability of something. So for an exchange of goods, imagine this, for an exchange, for any exchange of goods and services to take place, each party that's involved in that transaction must feel that they're receiving more than they're giving up. But if we break down a transaction into small steps, we see that first a measurement of value takes place either, either consciously or subconsciously before any exchange may take place. Now, if either party determines that in a transaction that the value received doesn't exceed the value given, then the exchange won't happen. In other words, if you're trying to sell me something and I believe that what you're asking is more than the value that I'm going to get, well, I'm not going to go with that deal. It's not going to happen. 
Thus we see that value is a measurement which is determined by each individual party to a transaction. And it's this measurement, whether it's in our own minds, whether it's conscious or whether it's subconscious, it's actually this measurement that actually allows that transition to take place. And so what we can say is that value is an arbiter of exchange. Now, arbiter is kind of a, I mean, a fancy word. Um, I don't use it very often in my language, but just to give you a definition, arbiter may, basically means it's the medium. It's the medium. It's something that facilitates the exchange. Now, regarding architectural services, architectural practices, of course, exist to serve a need in the marketplace. If there is no need in the marketplace, then architectural practices would not exist. So for an architectural project to occur, Obviously, an exchange needs to take place. Someone needs to exchange some money or some value, and then the architectural firm needs to provide those services. Now, we're going to jump over. We're going to take a, a quick detour here, and we're going to talk about a concept called fungibility. Fungi fungibility. Fungible is an obscure economic term that's actually become more, more popular now that we see the rise of NFTs. So if you haven't, if you haven't uh, been following the the crypto craze recently, NFTs stands for non-fungible token. And so this, this word has started to enter the mainstream. Fungible is an economic term, which means that something is able to be replaced or replace another identical item. It's mutually interchangeable. So fungibility is the measure of how much an item, a service, a product can be exchanged with another product or item that's equivalent on the marketplace. Now, according to Wikipedia, in economics, fungibility is the property of a good or commodity whose individual units are essentially interchangeable. So what we might say here is that at the something that's very fungible would be a commodity. So we might talk about beans, rice, wheat. Right? One grain of wheat is pretty much the same as another grain of wheat. One grain of rice of the same variety is the same as another grain of rice. So an example, another example of a fungible item is a monetary token, right? like a penny, like a coin of a particular value. Now, that coin can be replaced by another coin of the same kind. They're completely interchangeable. So this is what it means to be fungible. Again, as, as I mentioned, commodities are fungible. On the other hand, and here's the distinction, architectural services are not fungible. So we really need to get this. Architectural services are not fungible. Now, why is that important to the conversation of value here? And where are we talking about this obscure economic term? Well, unfortunately, in a buyer's mind, in a client's mind, oftentimes they're looking at architectural services and they're wanting them to be fungible. In other words, clients are wanting to compare apples to apples. They're wanting to compare your architectural services. They're wanting to compare your experience. They're wanting to compare your design ability, apples to apples, directly with another firm, another individual. But the crazy part here is that it can't be done. Like it's literally impossible. No matter, even if your firm, think about this for a minute, even if your firm is offering exactly the same services as another firm, exactly the same scope, exactly the same timeline, ultimately the experience of those services will be completely different because you're a different person, your team is different. And so what we ultimately end up here with the idea is that architectural services are not fungible. Now, this is important when it comes to how you price your services and how we measure the value of architectural services. And we'll be getting to that in a minute. So because architectural services are very complex and the way that they're delivered differs from firm to firm, we are going to refer to them and they are non-fungible items. Fungibility and this idea of being non-fungible ties into the idea of commoditization. Commoditization is the act in the marketplace of treating something like a commodity. Commodities in the marketplace are differentiated only by their price. So commodities in the marketplace are differentiated only by their price. In other words, at the very, the very basic level, again, if we go to a pinto bean, a pinto bean and another pinto bean, they can be completely exchanged. A bag of pinto beans is completely exchangeable on the marketplace. Now, when we talk about architectural services, there's a pressure in the marketplace from clients, from prospects, and just from the market in general that wants to commoditize architectural services. So commoditization happens when architectural services are perceived as equivalent or the same 
from firm to firm. And you may be experiencing commoditization pressure if you're experiencing, you're experiencing any of the following. Perhaps, and this happens all the time, you estimate the fee for a project, and then ultimately, after you see that fee, what happens? You think, oh, that's a very large fee. And so mentally, we reduce that fee out of worry that it's too much or too expensive for the client to stomach. I remember when I was running a practice full-time, I would do this all the time. It didn't matter how wealthy the client was, how big the budget was. At the end of the day, when I added up what I thought the fee should be, more often than not, I thought, wow, that's a lot. I'm, I don't know if the client will go for this. This is, this is a symptom of experiencing some form of commoditization. Number two, clients ask you to discount your fee to compete with cheaper competitors. When clients are asking you to compare and saying, look, this other firm's cheaper, can you knock some, can you knock some fee off of that? This is a symptom of commoditization. Number three, when clients focus on the bottom line of what your services cost instead of the value that they receive. So how many times do you have you seen or do you know that clients, when they get your proposal, they flip right to the end and they just look at that big number and they think, my, this is a lot of money. Number four, you may be experiencing commoditization if you find that at times clients think your services or perceive that your services are just about getting a stamp, just about getting approval, or they reduce your services to a formality or, quote, a necessary evil. Number five, you may be experiencing commoditization if clients are ignorant of the value that they can get from innovative solutions. In other words, if they don't see that a simple few design changes can have radical impact on the value, not only the resale value, but also the experience of the project. Now, Needless to say, commoditization is extremely bad for an architectural practice. It's bad for the industry. It's bad for teams. It's bad for clients. Competitive pressure reduces the fees that firms charge, which then makes it difficult for firms to provide the level and quality of service that they aspire to provide. In other words, when you're not able to charge very, very high fees, when you're not able to be highly compensated for the architecture that you deliver, ultimately, this puts a downward pressure on the quality, the time, and the effort you're able to put into an architectural project. So ultimately, the work suffers. Another unseen and negative and disastrous result of commoditization pressure is lower wages available for employees, lack of funds for reinvestment in your practice, a lack of cash reserves, meaning that when the next recession happens, well, we either move into the basement, we sell everything, we lay off of the employees, and then we spend the next boom time, half of the next boom time, the next years of plenty, trying to catch up with what we lost during the downturn. And not to mention more effort required to earn the same amount of money. So let me just work harder, right? So what I'd have you consider here is that at the end of the day, None of us architects are in it to become the next Bill Gates, the next Richard Branson, the richest person in the world. Right? We didn't get into it. I've rare, I've, I don't think I've ever met an architect who said that they came into architecture because they wanted to be wealthy or they wanted to get rich. However, here's the rub, and this is the difficult part. Money is like oxygen for an architecture practice. Without money, what happens? Without money, the practice dies. Without money, the mission and the ability to create architecture dies. It becomes non-existent. The more money, what I'd have you consider is that the more money a firm captures for its services, the more likely the firm will be able to survive, and not only survive, but just thrive. Because let's face it, if our goal in life, or if your goal in life is simply to, to survive, that is a very, very sad life indeed. So, capturing premium fees, being highly compensated for the work that you do as an architect, regardless of how good your designs are. Because if you're listening to the Business of Architecture podcast, I'm assuming that you're an incredible designer, that you do great work, right? Now, here's what capturing premium fees allows a firm to do. Capturing premium fees allows a firm to, there's just a few examples, a few things that this allows you to do. To pay top wages 
to yourself and your employees, to invest in the best branding and marketing, to invest in and acquire and pay for outbound business development, which ultimately strengthens your pipeline, which means that you don't have to worry about the feast or famine of projects. You have consistency and peace of mind. It allows you to provide a higher level of service because you're able to spend the time providing a higher level of quality in terms of the services you deliver, not to mention a higher level of quality of design, which ultimately rolls over into a higher level of quality of the built environment, meaning your architecture is better. You're able to invest in creating a great team culture. You can attract and invest in top talent. You have the time and mental space to, to think about strategic planning. You can protect against and prevent your own internal market downturns, meaning that when the market is going haywire that you can sell powerfully through, you can be one of the firms that's expanding and growing through the downturn instead of contracting. You can innovate. You can invest in the best software tools. You can hire the best team members and so, so much more. So what we see here is when we talk about money, being the oxygen of an architecture practice, this is what we're referring to. Thus, we see that it is in an architectural practice's best interest to maximize the fees captured for its work. Now, the only reason why we wouldn't maximize the fees that we're charging is because we believe or we doubt the value that we're providing to our clients. So the only thing that would cause us to undersell our services is because we doubt or we don't understand the great value that we provide to our clients. I was talking with an architectural colleague just last week, and he was talking about, he made an offhanded joke. He said, I've made developers millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars over the years. And he said it in a joking manner. We all laughed. <laughs> that's great. And, you know, oh, that's funny. But his comment revealed something, and I know that his comment revealed a deep sense of pain that he feels knowing that he has provided this value, but feeling at the end of the day that something's not right here. Let's move on. Let us revisit the definition of value. What is value? As I previously mentioned, value relates to the monetary worth of something, the perception of fair exchange, or the desirability of something. Now, what's interesting and, and almost crazy here is each of these definitions deals with human perception. The crazy part is that we oftentimes we approach the con conversation of value from a place of logic, from a place of academics. However, value and perception of value is not a logical conversation. It's a, it's a psycho psychological conversation because value is a function of human perception. So let's move on to this idea of semiotics. So semiotics is is in the the realm of linguistics and language semiotics is the study of what they call signs and symbols and their use or interpretation so in semiotics a signifier is anything that communicates a meaning for instance written words on a page are signifiers the words that you're hearing me speak right now are signifiers images can also be signifiers so imagine for a minute that you see a picture of a tree now, the picture may simply signify tree to you, or you may notice that there's a bench underneath the tree, or you may notice that there's morning fog covering the landscape. In any case, the picture itself obviously isn't the actual tree, it's not the actual bench, it's not the actual fog, but it's simply a representative image, which brings up a mental concept for us. So, in semiotics, the mental concept that is evoked from the signifier is called the signified. So in semiotics, we have a signifier. We, let's say we have a picture of a tree, and that brings up a mental image for us. That mental image or mental concept that's brought up in our brain is called the signified. So semiotics teaches us that concepts, knowledge, and language are all constructs of the human mind, which leads us to a very interesting discovery. And the discovery is this, that value is an abstraction. Value is an abstraction, right? Get this, value is an abstraction. It's a mental concept. So when we look at 
the terms used in semiotics. Value actually isn't a physical object that exists in the physical world. Value is something that is in, their, in the semiotics language. It's something that is signified. It's a mental construct. The key here is that value is subjective. It's a mental construct. And as such, and here's the key, as such, value and perception of value can be influenced. This is why some firms are charging fees that would not be enough to run a newspaper stand. <laughs> While on the other hand, firms are bringing in fees that are highly rewarding their team members, their owners, and clients are paying both, right? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why are some firms charging rock bottom, dirt cheap fees, and other firms are charging multiples, 10x what those firms are charging? What I'd have you consider is that, yes, there's obviously a difference in the value of services that these firms provide. There's definitely positioning in the marketplace, but ultimately what it comes down to is it comes down to perception. It comes down to the perception of the clients who are hiring these firms. So how do we then actually influence? How do we enter into a conversation where we begin to shape the perception of value? So this is the key. And this is what we're going to be jumping into in part two of this little mini-series on communicating your value as an architect. So just quickly to summarize, what we've gone over today is we've gone over the, first of all, some of the, uh, the excruciating pains that we experience as architects, <laughs> dealing with clients who at times seem like they don't understand or get our value. And let me tell you a quick story just to kind of drive this home. So uh, early in my career, when I was starting out my architectural practice, I was, I was, uh, you know, a star. I had stars in my eyes and a bushy tail, and I was excited and thought that just by simply hanging up my shingle, that I would have clients coming and paying me large fees to be able to do the work. Now, there's two things here. Number one, when I was starting out, I had very low overhead. So the fees that I was getting, I did think they were very large. But as my overhead grew and as my office grew, I suddenly realized those fees weren't sufficient. But here's what I did recognize. I did recognize that whenever I went into a fee conversation with a client, when I sent the proposal, many times they would just accept the proposal straight out. Sure, fine. But many times I found that they would question the fee. Or if there were changes or either changes from my side, changes in the project, oftentimes I felt uncomfortable approaching the client's because of these changes. So there was an element of me that didn't trust in or didn't believe in the value that I had. And in addition, there was also doubt on the client side about the value that they were getting. They were just focused on the numbers. Now, pre-COVID in 2019, I had the opportunity. We went over to London. That's when we launched the business of architecture with Ryan, with Ryan Willard in the UK. And that was back in 2018. Um, Shortly after that, in 2019, had the opportunity to take my entire family to London. We went to Italy, and I was finally, for the first time, able to see in person some of these great architectural works that I had only read about in the history books here in the United States. And we were able to see the Duomo. We went to Florence. We went to Rome. We saw St. Peter's. We saw the Sistine Chapel. I mean, we saw everything, right? And it was absolutely amazing. And what I noticed going to these great works of architecture was I was reminded again, of the beauty and the inherent value of architecture. Meaning, as I was walking through and seeing these beautiful spaces, even the streets of London, like the architectural fabric of the city of London is so fantastic, so incredible, so amazing. And there's a certain feeling that I got just walking those streets. This is why tourists come. This is why tourists visit London. This is why tourists visit Florence. This is why tourists visit Rome. It's because there's something in the human soul that is inspired by architecture, that aspires, that causes us to want to rise up as a human beings to recognize our own inner divinity. And so what I'd have you consider today as we finish up this little segment on value is that the value that you have as an architect, as a designer, is absolutely incredible. And have you consider 
that it's even past what you perceive your own value to be. Your value as a designer is past and far beyond what you may even perceive it to be. And what I'd have you consider is that our world today needs the architecture you can provide. Our world today needs the designs and your design talent. It needs your ideas. It needs your innovation. And the secret to being able to bring your value to the world is mastering this concept and this conversation of value. Because when clients don't recognize value, when we undervalue our own services, everyone loses. And this is not a winning place for the world. So in our next episode, tune in next week. We're going to be talking, we're going to be having a conversation about, number one, this idea of the psychology of value. How value is actually a psychological concept and how we can influence based upon the discoveries over the past 50 years of the field of behavioral economics and psychology. We'll be touching on what's called the labor theory of value. We'll talk about the subjective theory of value. You're going to be getting a crash course right here in the podcast around value. We're talking about the price elasticity of demand. We're going to go deep, but at the end of the day, we're going to give you some tools and some frameworks for actually being able to communicate your own value as an architect. But until we get there, what I'd have you consider is that your own value of architect, uh, the value of your architectural services, the way you present those and your ability to influence and your ability to show and communicate that value can only rise to the level of your own belief in your value. And that's a wrap. Today's episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step business training program that's helped over 200 and 37 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of running a business doesn't get in the way of the architecture. Because you see, it likely isn't your architecture or design skills that hold you back as an architect. It's the complexity of running and managing a practice, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. If you are ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash training to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.